Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Rounds presentation on Get a Kit, an online HIV and STI testing service. My name is Austin Zygmunt, and I'm a public health physician at PHO with a focus on sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. I have the pleasure of moderating today's session and would like to state that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Before we begin, I will mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled, so please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session. We will have a discussion and question period following the presentation. If at any point during the presentation you have uh, technical issues, please email capacitybuilding, that's one word, at ohpp.ca. It is now my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Patrick O'Byrne. He is a nurse practitioner with Ottawa Public Health, a full professor of nursing at the University of Ottawa, and the principal investigator of Getikit. Dr. O'Byrne's clinical and research work focus on the prevention and diagnoses of sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. I will hand it over to you now, Patrick, to begin the presentation. Thank you, Austin. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining as well. Uh, it's always nice to talk about Getikit and sort of where we've gotten to. We've discussed this previously in relation to the HIV self-tests, but um, the STI component to it is something that's new, um, something that's uh, great that we're able to offer uh, and basically to show uh, everyone so that it's it, it's a new piece. But before I get into that though, I, I think just laying out right, the background, like where where did getting kit come from? This was something we had been discussing and thinking of back through to 2018, 2019 that we started working on. Um, and what occurred uh, in 2020 COVID, right? And did that shutter the need for dedicated actually accelerated it, right? Conversely, instead of saying, no, this isn't something we need, it became something that we really, really needed uh, due to access, right? There were very necessary deployments, the COVID response, right? All of this needed to occur, but nonetheless, despite all of our best efforts, uh, people did continue to get STIs, right? New HIV infections, all of this was occurring and ongoing. And so it became necessary for us to say, how do we create uh, an access point for people to get tested at that point for HIV and now for STIs? And uh, to do this where, right, rural, remote, you live downtown, you live, right, wherever you, any, anywhere, anyone, anywhere can get, right, correct access uh, to the proper testing uh, and be able to do it in labs that are local to them. So instead of funneling everyone into sort of downtown mega centers or STI clinics, right, how can we use those STI clinics as treatment centers, as hubs and sort of portals where you can come in and get your vaccines uh, and be seen if you're symptomatic, if you have language barriers, if you can't use or won't use the internet, these types of things um, becomes useful, but we also need, right, mass screening. We have long, as public health practitioners said, the number one symptom of an STI is none, do your screening, right? It's the best way to know. Um, and it, it's a way for us to maintain that message. And lastly, no one is not dealing with capacity. Capacity for our ability to work, right, is everywhere. It's in every health unit, it's in every clinical setting. And so this is a way as well for us to right, expand access to testing uh, without having capacity being such a crushing uh, burden for us to deal with. So that's, that's kind of the, the background. So getting into it, disclosures, uh, none to disclose. Uh, I am a public appointee to the Minister of Health for OACHA. Uh, nothing I'm saying here um, is in that sort of vein. So not to be taken in that way. Uh, funding is all public, uh, no private or industry funding, conflicts of interest, uh, none to declare. So the context in Ontario, let's lay it out. Everyone knows where we are, things are going up. Right? We have gonorrhea, we have chlamydia, we have uh, actually HIV syphilis, everything except for syphilis dipped during COVID, that just continued its upward march. Um, but we had dips during COVID, likely due to some reduced transmission, likely due as well to decreased case finding, right? Less ability to actually get testing. Now that testing capacities and volumes have increased again, everything is unsurprisingly increasing. Gonorrhea back to effectively pre-COVID levels. Um, chlamydia is still a little bit down, but rebounding syphilis, again, it, it's upward onward march um, that we're all dealing with and struggling with. Uh, and HIV having returned to just uh, below pre-COVID levels as well. So the context is effectively ongoing transmission that is rebounding, um, increased testing. But as always, we know access to testing becomes a barrier, whether that's a barrier on the healthcare side, meaning that it's difficult, right, to actually have the capacity, or a barrier on the individual side in sort of geographic distance to a clinic, 
or their willingness, alternatively reluctance to go into a clinic um, and actually sort of advocate or say what they need. Highly stigmatized infections, um, disclosure of injection drug use, of same sex practices, of casual sex, anonymous sex, sex with drugs, chem sex, right? This can always be highly stigmatized. And so sometimes this may not be disclosed. So that is effectively the context of what we're looking at is increasing rebounding rates. So back in uh, 2017, if people will remember, if you were working in sexual health at that point, we switched from culture for gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, in the oral pharynx and the rectum to that based uh, molecular testing. And so what we did in Ottawa was actually say, uh, what proportion of these infections were extra genital exclusively, so oral or rectal only, not identified, the urine test was in fact negative. Um, when it was culture, and then what did that proportion become once we switched to the molecular testing? So with NATS. So in the table two that you can see here, extra genital only, uh, gonorrhea 31.4% and chlamydia 41.3. So even by culture, that's pretty decent. And the sensitivity on culture is not the greatest. Uh, but when you go to table three, which is the right the switch post molecular testing, um, gonorrhea went up to 69.8%, seven out of 10 uh, gonorrhea infections that we identify um, in the sexual health clinic in Ottawa and guys who have sex with guys are exclusively extra genital. Um, and for chlamydia, it was 64.8. So it's 65 to 70%. What this, like to so take the gonorrhea, that 69.8%, the 70%, it really means that for every three infections that we identify in urine, uh, if we just did urine testing, we would miss seven uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia, sorry, seven gonorrhea infections uh, in these guys. So that means that it's important for us to not just rely on genital testing for gonorrhea chlamydia, but to also remember, right, these infections can be extra genital. It's appropriate and important to do this testing, um, but. Uh, it, it's not for everybody. And I get into that a little bit more that we don't want to just be doing all testing for everybody all the time without any sort of risk assessment. It, it is, as always, with every test that we do, appropriate and important to make sure right, that we target to the individuals who need it the most. So Getikit, how does Getikit come in? But before that, what exactly is it? Now, if you've ever been to a presentation on this before, this is unchanged. Uh, it's an automated clinical decision tool that recommends and provides sexual health services. Uh, and what is it automating? It's automating guidelines from the Public Health Agency of Canada, Ministry of Health in Ontario, Public Health Ontario, Public Health Ontario Lab, uh, and the Canadian Medical Association Journal Guidelines. So this, this doesn't mean that it's a way for people to go on and sort of like a menu at a fast food restaurant, say, I want X, Y, and Z tests. Not the case at all. What the system does, I'm going to show this and sort of walk everyone through it. What the system does is you go on and you, just like if you walked into an STI clinic, you say who you are and what you do and when you were last tested and what you were diagnosed with. The system takes this information and says, okay, with your sort of risk profile, risk pro practices, demographics, and so forth, uh, according to the guidelines that we have currently in place, what testing would be recommended to you? In other words, if you come and see me, right, as a nurse practitioner in the sexual health clinic in Ottawa, and you told me, right, this is who you are, and this is what you do, and this is when you were last tested, in my head, I'm going to say these are the tests that are indicated for you. The computer is going to do the exact same thing and ensure that it is exactly to the guidelines. What's available? So currently, um, and this is, a, I'll show you the actual regions and areas where all this is available, but currently the things that we're offering gonorrhea chlamydia testing, and this is urine testing, and this would be a requisition that somebody would take to the lab, swabs, oral and rectal swabs. But for guys who have sex with guys, we're going to be seeing 65 to 70% of the infections we'd be identifying uh, would be through these swabs and not the urine test. So it's important if we're going to tell people, yes, we're doing full comprehensive Right, testing for you, right, that we get actually all of the testing done and it's appropriate. Syphilis serology, I mean, in the context of the epi slide that shows that these numbers are just continuously increasing, right, syphilis serology uh, becomes important. Uh, and this is not restricted to guys who have sex with guys. Syphilis serology for women who have sex with men, exceptionally important. We're seeing rises in congenital syphilis. Now, I think the fact data was showing right about a 25, 100% uh, increase in congenital syphilis in Ontario from 2018 to 2022. And so consequently, this serology, right, is for anyone who has that clinical indication, uh, this definitely uh, would be following. 
hepatitis C, right? Uh, injection drug use or partners who engage in injection drug use, guys who have sex with guys uh, once annually, particularly if HIV positive. And then HIV testing, there's the serology and uh, the self test that we've been offering back since 2020. So this is the list of what's available, but it doesn't mean that it is available to everybody uh, because the same thing, if you walked in to see me at the sexual health clinic, not everyone's going to get all of these tests. It's going to be tailored to what is clinically indicated for each patient, in this case, each user uh, as they go through the system. Just to bring back up the Public Health Ontario, right? This is uh, PHOL, um, what they actually have for the clinical guidelines for who should have throat and rectal swabs. Um, I'll just read it out. Uh, rectal and pharyngeal testing is recommended for individuals who have had unprotected sex at these sites and are in specific at-risk groups or have risk factors, including gay, bi, and men who have sex with men, including trans women, individuals engaged in sex work or who have had sexual contact with someone engaging in sex work. So, Right, an individual who does sex work or the clients, uh, individuals who are known contacts, a Google who have been diagnosed with gonorrhea or chlamydia, and individuals who have signs or symptoms of rectal or pharyngeal infection. So that's the guideline. There's a little caveat below that says, or right, based on your clinical guidance and judgment. Clinically, in person, in the sexual health clinic, somebody comes in, there's going to be exceptions to this. That's my clinical judgment. When it comes to the actual algorithms and the rules of etiquette, it really is those four bullets to say, this is who has the clinical indication. The computer's not making a clinical judgment. It is basically just going through and imposing the guidelines. So it really goes back to that. And it's, it's really to say we don't want and shouldn't be, and we don't have evidence to be doing right throat and rectal swaps for every, absolutely everybody. This is where when we did our validation back in 2016, 2017 through the sexual health clinic in Ottawa and hassle free. This was really where we found uh, right that we had good evidence to show that the testing was adequate, appropriate, um, and that lab accreditation standards. The other thing that goes on, and this is exceptionally important, that if we are sending swabs out to people, it's not just swabs and it's a best of luck. Right? We actually do provide a bunch of materials to them. There's an information sheet, uh, which is that big sheet. You can see there's QR codes on it. There's information on how to do it, very specific details. Um, there's We included as well colored pictures so that you can see how to do your throat swab, how to do your rectal swab, and the QR codes linked to YouTube videos uh, that actually walk through over a couple minutes. If anyone's ever been to HQ, you've seen these videos running uh, in their waiting room. Uh, Get a Kit and HQ actually mutually uh, created these, and it was to effectively have this so that people could follow through the videos, right? We have printed material, we have it in text, we have an image, and then we have videos uh, as well to really say it's not just about sending out a swab and hoping for the best. It's about sending out a swab to an individual where there's good evidence and then there's all the supports that go to it to make sure that the swabs are done correctly, they're labeled correctly, right? All of the pieces uh, come together to actually work. So this is my heaviest slide on text. And I'm just going to walk through slowly because there's actually a bunch of steps that occur. And so the difference in color, the blue is really the decentralized components. What does that mean? It's the part where people would have like local access or the local ordering provider in Getikit is going to right, actually come into play. The text that is just in the standard black, black font, that is what occurs through the Getikit system. So that's the centralized component. So user, whoever it is, decides I want to get testing. I'm going to go to Getikit. I'm going to log on. Step one, they access the website, right, getikit.ca. They register, they complete the consent form, they give a name, they give a number, an email, they get a multi-factor authentication to validate, to ensure the contact information is correct. And then they go through and they actually complete a risk assessment. And I will uh, do a couple live demos of this uh, process as well. Then in the background, the algorithm takes this and says, okay, based on who you said you are and all these different pieces, it will put up onto the screen a list of tests that are clinically indicated. The user then says, yes, I want this one. I don't want that one. And if they say they don't want something, the computer will say to them, or the website will say, you're opting out of testing that we think is indicated for you. This could you leave you at risk for delayed diagnosis of infection, ongoing transmission, right? risk. All of that, a little blurb pops up. And the person must right, uh, acknowledge that. So when they hit submit and say, yes, I want this, uh, then on the back end, it appears, right, and it appears to those of us who actually run the system, and there's a get a kit nurse who goes through and says, 
based on this person and what they've reported, right? Is everything that they've opted in and out of uh, appropriate? And the order is approved, rejected, modified, um, right? And it, it's basically sent at that point into logistics. The Getikit system, once approved, generates requisitions um, and it pulls the local ordering provider. So what does that mean? This is not, this, this local ordering provider, little parenthesis here is actually exceptionally important. Getikit is not a remote virtual STI testing platform. It is an online access portal to local testing providers. So in Ottawa, I am the ordering provider, but in Kingston, right, it is uh, the Associate Medical Officer of Health. Uh, in Renfrew, it is the medical officer. Um, in Leeds, it's uh, one of the nurse practitioners in the STI clinic. Uh, so basically, it depends on where you are. There is a local ordering provider, and what that means is if you do have a positive result, which I'll get to later on, right, that provider is close to you and can bring you in and say, now we're going to give you treatment, right, and we're going to be able to do that. Knowing that, I mean, really, if we take gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, two out of three are injectables, first-line treatment. Uh, it's appropriate and important, and I keep using those two words, it is exceptionally important that people have access to local treatment that is done first-line. And individuals aren't just said, told, you have a positive result, go forth, best of luck, find treatment for yourself. I and mean, that's not the model, really, that we're looking for. And so no STI testing was ever available in an area, and the HIV self-tests are, but the STI part is never available unless there's a local ordering provider and clinic that will order the tests and will right, assume responsibility to treat, and we create the pathways to make sure that happens. So that's fine, right? This is all of what goes into building that requisition with the local ordering provider. Step six, logistics comes in and we build the little packages. Individual will get their self-test and or their recs and or their swabs uh, sent out to them, um, or it becomes available in the user portal. Um, so if you're not getting a physical object, um, like a swab or a self-test, somebody who is just doing a urine test for gonorrhea, chlamydia, blood testing for HIV and syphilis, in this case, they will be given the option uh, to have it mailed to them as a requisitions or a printed home where the requisitions once approved will uh, show up in their portal. They can then uh, print them themselves if they have a printer, or I mean, the, the private labs, biotest life labs, Dynacare, you can actually take that PDF and drag it right into their systems, and then you just show up with your health card. So that's the point where the requisitions become available. It's not immediate. There is, in fact, a clinical review to make sure it's appropriate. Once that occurs, uh, the user gets a message. Automated message system says, hey, something's happened, log in and check it out. This is much like your bank or Canada Revenue Agency. It doesn't pop up on the screen and say your test swabs are available. It just says that there's activity on your account, log in to see uh, what's going on. So nothing actually appears in the message. Where did we get to? Step eight, the user receives everything. So this is the decentralized component, right? So centralized is the website and it is the screening to make sure everyone's getting exact testing per guidelines. It is the building right, of the swabs and the test kits and everything. So we know they're not expired, they're the right ones, they go with the right requisitions. Um, many of you who practice in primary care, at some point you are probably sent a swab with a different rec, uh, not knowing Roche goes with PHOL and Hologic goes with MOA. Right? It's not just getting the right swab, it's getting the right swab with the right piece of paper in Ontario. And so that's all put together in a centralized fashion to make sure that we don't have any of those just logistics and bureaucratic issues that arrive. People will be able to get their testing. So then the individual gets this package and they go to the local lab, right? They go to their private lab with their health card. Um, they say, here's my requisitions. Here's the swabs I've done. They give that to the lab. The lab looks and says, oh, you're also supposed to do a blood test and a urine test, have a seat, let's take some blood. Um, here's your urine cup, go to the bathroom. And off the individual goes. There was, the tests all go off to PHOL or the private lab. That's all done in the background in the local area. And then the results come back. And the results are copied to the local provider. Maybe that's the person who's actually ordering it. Uh, positive, negative results all back to that individual. And then all of those results also come back into Getikit, where they become visible to the user. So the person can actually see their results uh, and have an idea of what's going on with it. They also get a message each time a, a new result is available saying, again, there's an activity on your account, log in. So instead of relying on the 
you're going to have to wait two weeks. No news is good news, which actually, if you look at the CPSO standard for results management, is listed as the worst option you can possibly have. In this case, it notifies the person the moment a result is available, uh, and right now they have the ability to actually go in and see it. Next, um, we have the person is treated. So this is in italics, and it's really as needed as a PRN. You only need to treat people who need to be treated. Um, in Ottawa, I'm going to ruin the results uh, outcome. Approximately five, I think it's 543 people. Actually, this is in Ottawa, just uh, running 543 people uh, have gone through this uh, since we launched the STI component June 1st, and I think it's around 16 people have tested positive. So when we talk about capacity and workload, um, the number who needed to be treated was actually 16 um, of 543-ish. Uh, and then lastly, reminders, um, Cancer Care Ontario has done an exceptionally good job uh, for cancer screening, right, on sending uh, reminders every three years uh, to people who need cervical cancer screening. You get a letter in the mail that invites you to go and do your pap test, uh, your HPV screening. And as it's going to modify, you get this reminder. We know these reminders work. This is an excellent evidence-based strategy. And so Dedicate does the same thing for STI testing but it is not generic, right? Everything is tailored uniquely to the individual. So the guy who has sex with guys, right? If uh, you've seen Austin and I did a presentation back in May, May, April of 2023 of the new Ontario HIV testing guidelines for HIV, right? The 2023 guidelines that we uh, just released. And as you guys who have sex with guys, it's supposed to be two, three months. So every three months, right? Guys with ongoing risk factors should go back uh, and retest for HIV. And so this will be every three months for guys who have sex with guys who report uh, new partners on going risk practices. Uh, women who have sex with men who are white, who are Canadian born, who are 20, uh, annual chlamydia testing is recommended or with new partners, right? So that 12 month reminder will be sent out to say, right, even if you have the same partner, it's time for you to repeat your urine testing. Uh, come on back in and they get a single reminder once after. So it's a bunch of steps to go through, but nonetheless, um, it's just to lay it out so you have a good visual that there's a bunch of stuff happening. The guidelines say three to six months, right? So we have, um, from the fact, the public health agency guidelines, SDI guidelines, says repeat screening. And this is screening. This is not a test of pure. I want to be exceptionally clear on this. We are not talking about test of pure. We are talking about re-screening screening, right, looking for asymptomatic disease and otherwise healthy individuals, right, they have an infection, they're unaware of it, and a lot of you having it, we want to make sure that it was gone, treated, like the test of cure being very different, testing, you come in with a bunch of discharge, this is, right, when should we bring you back for re-screening post-infection? So gonorrhea, six months, chlamydia, three months, and then the Ontario uh, gonorrhea guidelines, six months, right, so it, it's three to six months uh, we should have routine testing. So how do we automate that? I talked about these retest reminders. Here is just a couple of them that I took a look, that I sort of did a screen capture of. Uh, I had the system email these to me, and then uh, I screen captured them out of my inbox. So for HIV, this is effectively what it looks like. A uh, question we get a lot is, how often should I retest? And I mean, clinically, I get this all the time. People ask me, when should I come back? How frequently should I be testing? In this case, the answer is no, right? You get the message at the time uh, that the guidelines say you should retest. In keeping with the Ontario Ministry of Health HIV testing guidelines, we recommend testing at three weeks, six weeks, and three months, 363 after possible exposure. If you're getting this email, it's been at least three months since your last order, and it might be a good time to reorder at getakit.ca. Person can then click on that, log in, complete the risk assessment, right? And uh, be given any clinically indicated testing uh, that's needed. Syphilis, also exceptionally important, and so we also have an automated message on that, um, and it is, is it time to retest as the subject heading, and then the content is, did you know the window period for syphilis testing is four weeks? Consider retesting for syphilis if it's been four weeks since your last contact with somebody new, or if your last testing was within the four weeks of having had a sexual contact. We also recommend retesting for syphilis in the third trimester during pregnancy, weeks 27 to delivery, even if you haven't had a new sexual contact or sexual contact with anyone new. You can learn more about syphilis here, and then it clicks into uh, a website. Uh, to retest for syphilis, you can see your healthcare provider. You can also log into Getikit to reorder syphilis testing today. So again, it is right sending this out. 
So anyone who comes through the system identifies uh, as somebody who could get pregnant and identifies as somebody who is pregnant, right? Those two factors, it's going to trigger in to say, let's send a syphilis retest reminder, um, right? So that we're doing a little bit more follow-up uh, with pregnant uh, people. Other reminders, the requisitions go out um, and it's okay, what happens once we have released these requisitions into the wild. Individuals do receive five automated messages. The first one is at order saying, thanks for placing your order. It will be reviewed. Um, and if when possibly reviewed, modified, you'll get a message saying, right, that your whatever has occurred, it's on its way or it's been canceled. Then they get a message at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. And the one at eight weeks is basically saying, right, it, it's been two months, you haven't used these requisitions, they're no longer valid. And that is in fact printed across the requisitions saying these requisitions are valid for eight weeks from the date of ordering, I do not process thereafter. And so the, the two week one, right, it just says it's a reminder, your requisition, and it will pull out the tests you've done, will expire in six weeks. Please take this in your health card to a local lab as soon as possible to complete the test. If you've already done it, disregard. If you have questions, right, send us a message. And then the other one I put there is the cancellation. So it's it's also saying you have these go and do your testing, right? Go you you sought out testing, right? We we deemed that clinically this was indicated for you, right? And this has been sent out. Uh, so please do that actual uh, follow up and testing. So those are the retest reminders. So who can use it? That depends on age, risk factors, and where you live. So age, you got to be eighteen and older, so right, 17 and under, yeah, you won't be using this. Risk factors, you need to have a risk factor for STBBI acquisition, right? So sexually active, using drugs, sharing drugs, please have something, because if you come in and say, I've never had sex and I've never used drugs, there's zero reason for testing to be done. And in fact, approximately 20% of people who go through Get A Kid are screened out. They're trying to test every week. They are trying to test it frequently. They have no risk factors and run rate of about um, that number are actually screened out. And then location. So the HIV self tests, which we've been distributing since July 20th, 2020, uh, is available province wide. Um, these are just kits that can be mailed out that people can do, and then they can report their uh, self test result back to us, or they can go and find uh, local confirmatory testing were they to need to reactive testing. For participating public health unit jurisdictions, uh, the swabs, the serology, the urine test is all available. And I think there was a question in there saying, right, where, where is this actually available? So uh, currently, Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, uh, Kingston, Frontenac, Lanark, and Addington, North Bay, Perry Sound, Ottawa Public Health, Hastings, Prince Edward, and Renfrew are all offering the STI portals. Uh, Leeds, right, is one of the nurse practitioners in the STI clinic, KFLA, is an associate medical officer of health. North Bay is the medical officer. Ottawa Public Health is me uh, through the STI clinic. Hastings Prince Edward is a medical officer. Renfrew is medical officer. Uh, Peterborough will launch, you can see March 4th. Windsor will launch March 1st. And Eastern and Peel are in the process of um, going through, I mean, because there's a bunch of steps to say, like what testing do you want? When do you want to launch? Um, how do we set up all the, uh, the procedures? How do we make sure that we have people tested, right? All of that gets set up. So we're just working through that with these two. But that is effectively where we have it available uh, currently. So you can see a, a few different areas. So what have we had for outcomes? Um, most about cis, cis female, quarter, cis male, right, two thirds. Uh, GBMSM gave bisexual men on sex with men 52%, African Caribbean black 16%, indigenous 2.5%, majority being white 42%. Uh, for diagnostic outcomes, so testing numbers, 543 was right, 12 people have been diagnosed with chlamydia, uh, gonorrhea 1, syphilis 1, and 249 people have done syphilis testing positivity rates uh, listed there. Now, this is also going to be people who haven't made it to the lab yet in the 543, so the numbers will be slightly higher. Uh, HIV, this is running back to 2020, right? And so they have 28 diagnoses, uh, positivity rate of 0.3%. So, right, we are getting people tested and it's not uh, just individuals, right, who need to screen and screen negative, but that is actually quite important for gonorrhea chlamydia. We do need to screen a lot of people most of whom are going to test negative, and like to actually be able to identify when people need treatment. So let's try this out. And I'm going to go into the actual system now, which should be sharing currently. 
So this is the website itself. Um, and you land on it, it's got right, a landing page, it's got the information, right, who's eligible. For a new person, they would go to register. Uh, they right fill out their registration information. They are right all the standard things. I'm going to skip that and just go into the my account and log in. And it does run through multi-factor authentication. That is to increase the security of the system. We know that this will be a barrier for some, uh, but due to right what we're processing, we want to make sure the system is as secure as possible. So an individual lands in their dashboard. And just before I forget this. There is the order history, which if you go in here, right, these are previous orders, test orders that I placed through. And you can see right what's been done. And when I click on view, right, it will actually give me all the results. And if I click on this see more, it will actually give uh, text that is local, right? So it your test was negative. Rescreen if you have new risk factors, if you develop symptoms or your contact, go and see somebody. Right. it's important that you're seen and get tested. So this is on the user side, what would appear once all the results are there, the status of the order, the date, right? the actual order, everything's there. So let's order a test. Okay, so the first thing here is Canada Post is identifying discrepancy in my address. That's correct, right? So just to make sure it actually runs through Canada Post, it fires off to the address checker, is that the address you put on file is correct? Everyone's probably ordered something online at some point where it's like this address, or do you mean this one? That's what's happening here. It's to make sure it's actually delivered to uh, trivial addresses. And I'll say, yes, I still want to use that one. So it's important here to know who I am, right? Demographics, born in Canada, ethnicity, white, cis man, bisexual. So this is the patient. This is the person who's presenting. And I'm going to go through these questions a bit quickly um, and just reading out what it is we're really getting out of it. Uh, but do I have any symptoms? I'm going to say no. If I said yes, it's going to ask for a unique follow up. It's recommended that you be seen in person. I'm just going to move through that. Second, am I a contact? Any partners within the last four weeks diagnosed with any infections? I'm going to say none of the above. Uh, am I taking HIV pre exposure prophylaxis? No. If yes, it's going to ask me, like, am I doing my every three month blood testing? I have sex with. So this is a white man who identifies as bisexual uh, who says partners are cis male. Um, some of my partners' risk factors are HIV positive. They are guys who have sex with guys. It would have to be in this case. Uh, anatomically, what do I have? Person has a penis. Uh, sexual practices, oral sex, given and received, uh, anal sex talk. So no receptive anal sex um, being reported here. Uh, have I ever, so this is sex work, right? exchange drugs, money, sex, so forth. Have I ever been tested before? If I say yes, it will say when. I'm just going to skip through that. Um, have I ever shared drug equipment, right? Hepatitis C testing, that's really where this is coming in. And now that it's done, it is going to say, you know, it's, it's calculating based on my postal code to say you're in an area where STI testing could be available if you were, right, able to use it. So it says, do I have any form of insurance where I could go to a lab? I'm going to say yes. Then it's going to say, okay, you have insurance, but are you actually going to go to a lab? Because some of you will say yes, but I'm, I'm not going to a lab. Um, so I'm going to say yes, I'm going to a lab. And then it spits out, this is the actual list of tests that it's sort of recommending for them. So we have the oral swab, and this is the part where I have to actually opt in. So I say, yes, I'd like my oral swab. Yes, I'd like my urine test. Yes, I'd like my HIV self test. Yes, I'd like a uh, syphilis test. And you can see the continue to shipping is still grayed out. It's because before I can get the HIV serology, I have to click on this link. And a pretest information form comes up informing me about the right rules around reporting. We have the public health reporting rules and laws around disclosure, uh, the availability of anonymous testing, right? Talco, all of these resources become available, plus some information on HIV transmission. You can also see in here the self test and the serology. It says this is a self test you do at home. Window period is 12 weeks. False positive rate five in a thousand can also yield invalid results, whereas serology is a blood test in a lab, detect after six weeks false positive rate of essentially zero for the manufacturers. So once I do this, I'd say, yes, my ability to continue to shipping does appear, right? And if I go into this, um, right, I have the ship to my address. I'm going to redo this quickly. And I'm going to say, I don't want the oral swab. I do want the urine test. I don't want the self test. Uh, I have to do my serology pretest form. And I do want serology, and I do want serology. 
continue to shipping. And when I do that, in this case, because there's nothing physical coming to me, now it's just requisitions. It says, do I want print at home, right? Take these recs to a local lab uh, or ship to my address. So the ability to do both of those uh, becomes available. Then I just click or read my order and selected. I've opted out of those, place my order. And right, that's all done. Everything's uh, been placed in. So that's that's pretty straightforward. I'm going to go into the dashboard here just to show you perhaps you know it's on what we have. So these are the live statistics on it. So total number of orders placed with the system uh, to date, 10,226. Uh, 10 today, which is seven less than yesterday, so 17 yesterday. Uh, proportion of people who said they've never done STI testing before, 2,639 or 26% of people. And this is with 75% of these orders coming from the HIV priority populations. Gay, bi, trans, men, have sex with men, members of indigenous communities, uh, people of African Caribbean, black ethnicities, people who use drugs, right? So within this, um, right, you're getting 25% who are still saying, I've never actually done any testing before. And so into the orders, effectively, this is redacted. Um, and this is the global view from my account. But as the orders come in, you can see they are available. And this is what they, what they look like. Into an actual account. I'm going to put mine in here. Uh, there we go. And we go here. Open the load. Uh, there is that latest order that I just did. And view order summary. And what's declined? Yeah, all of that's there. So I'm just going to turn the privacy mode off. So this is the account. This is what we just went through. And this is what the order looks like on the back end for those of us who are actually running it um, and doing the testing. So we have, that loads up once more. Symptoms, no, right? All of that questionnaire that we just went through right there. So for when we do have positive results and we need to do our case management follow-up and our data entry, right? It, it's right there for us. Uh, the recommended services, right? It's all there. Other indicated testing. I skipped over this in the system, but it really does show um, other services. This was a guy who had sex with guys, so it said you should also learn about HPV vaccination, mpox vaccination, and PrEP. Uh, and then the decline tests, those that I opted out, are listed here. For the requisitions, I just click on this button. I talked about right us approving and saying yes, that does make sense. Uh, so we click on this button, and it is actually now generating the requisitions. Um, and then the shipping is done as well, just through a different tab uh, where we click on this and we have the ability to get the shipping label. So you can see here the recs that appeared. I'm going to close this tab uh, and make this slightly bigger where you can see, right, that requisition that appears. I am ordering a test for myself, right? I'm in my area, so this wouldn't actually work, but the gonorrhea, chlamydia, everything else is scratched out, HIV, syphilis. And down at the bottom, this requisition is only valid for eight weeks, as I talked about, right? Don't process it uh, after that date. So this is really what it looks like uh, on the back end. Now, what I want to do is just switch this to complete. And the reason I want to do that is I want to do one more as I go through it, just sort of to end it out. So we're going to go into my account. I'm going to change what. So, you know, like this time, I'm going to be a cis woman who is straight, say, and this will save my demographics. It takes just a second uh, to load those in. And now I'm going to order a test again. Uh, oh, it's because I have an outstanding one. My complete didn't work. Uh, let me just cancel out that last order. Make sure the privacy mode's on. Yep. Go. Loading it up. Order status. And I'm going to delete this, which is not the ability of most people. This is something that's, again, restricted to uh, really administrator accounts. All right. Let us. Order. 
So I don't have a pending order. That's another interesting thing. I do have a pending order, so I can't reorder, right? It's blocking, as I talked about, it blocks for people who try to come back and say, I've ordered requisitions, they would come, I want to get them again, right? It, it doesn't allow it until that order is done. Meaning even if results are pending from the laboratory, we get the urine test, we're waiting for the swab, uh, but you're blocked from reordering until we actually complete each order. So now I am a white straight woman. Um, address is correct. I don't have any symptoms. Again, I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, I'm not a contact of any STIs. I'm not taking PrEP. Uh, I have sex with cis men. And, um, some of my partners use injection drugs. Sure. Uh, anatomically, I have a vagina. Uh, oral sex, so sexual practices, oral, given and received, and vaginal. Uh, pregnant? No. That's going to ask, ask about pregnancy. And then it's going to say, how do I know I'm not pregnant? I'm going to say that I use contraception and I use it as prescribed. Uh, any sex work? No. Uh, have I ever been tested before? No. Just to skip those questions. Uh, do I share drug equipment? No. Um, do I have insurance? Yes. And am I willing to go to the lab? Yes. And so now, right, the testing, urine, self-test, serology. So the oral swab is not there, right? Thinking of that bulleted list from Public Health Ontario lab, right, women who have sex with men, um, there is no indication for that throat swab. What we saw when I went into the back end was that extra indicated services. It does occur here, and this is where it pops up on the individual's account, um, where it's saying, right, this person said their partner partners partner use injection drugs uh, and so it's also it's saying to the individual prep might be something for you to consider right and if i click on that it takes us to uh, the ontario prep website uh, which loads up slowly and they're coming in there we go where people can get sort of the ontario information about prep in ontario and if for naloxone, uh, not something you can go into the MOH one to say, like, where can you actually get it? You put in your postal code and it shows you all of the local areas. So the recommendations said in the very beginning, it's about offering testing and services. If this individual came into me again in clinic, I would say you should also right, consider PrEP uh, and naloxone is something that right, might be of interest to you. And so it's to do all this and to do it per guidelines. And we know right, what's an interesting thing in this case is how many people actually offer a PrEP to right, women who have risk factors for HIV? It's exceptionally low, we know from the Ontario data, but the website will impose right, the clinical guidelines. And so in some cases, it may actually outperform our clinicians to say, this woman actually has a clinical indication for PrEP. Let's make sure she gets uh, that offer given to her. So now that's the end of that demo part. I'm just going to go back to the slide deck Here and resume. And that should work. And so that's really uh, everything I had coming in one minute under, thankfully. Uh, I can see there's 18 questions in the chat. So I think we're going to have a little bit of a conversation now. Um, but thanks for coming. Um, if you do have questions, you can email me. You can see there if you're also interested in what's sort of coming next in information. Uh, when we release data, if we're doing events, you can follow the social media. Uh, and the team puts everything up there, uh, right? So you, so you can keep abreast of what we're actually up to. With that, I'll turn it over to Austin. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation, Patrick. And as you noted, we have a fair number of questions, but if there are others, please use the Q&A pod. Patrick, our questions are really focused on some process clarification, some statistics of the program, and then um, possibilities for expansion in the future. So perhaps we can start with some process questions first, and maybe you're slide that summarizes all the steps would be useful to, to pull up if you can. There was a few questions around eligibility for the program. Must you have a, an Ontario health card number or those without um, OHIP coverage eligible for this program? I am attempting a multitask here. I brought up the slide you asked me about. Um, do you need to have OHIP? No, you need a form of insurance that you can take to uh, a private laboratory. Uh, anything that Dynacare Life Labs Biotest would accept, uh, IFH, Indigenous uh, Services Coverage, uh, OHIP, uh, Private Insurance, Military, Blue Cross, any of those uh, would work. Uh, what we also have in Ottawa is there's, a, there's actually a slightly different pathway because we're also using our STI clinic effectively as a lab. 
where we'll say to the individual, do you have insurance? If they say no, we'll say, would you be willing to go to 179 Clarence, which is the address of our sexual health clinic, right, to actually drop off your swabs and have your blood and urine done? And some individuals who are uninsured can get access that way. Um, so it's a, it's a different pathway. Uh, but again, everything in this is it's not virtual care that the person is left on their own. It's a virtual access to a bricks and mortar clinic that is geographically close to them. So any insurance, but there's ways to have it testing for people who are uninsured as well. There's a question on the ordering provider. So per um, jurisdiction or health unit, is it just one local ordering provider or are there several that can participate in the program? It's just one per region. And so we have um, the public health units have selected somebody in all of the areas where this operational uh, to say this is the individual who would be the ordering provider for that region. This question on the mailing address for receiving the kits, are they able to mail to a PO box? Yeah, yes, we actually get a good number of orders like that. Not everyone wants this showing up where somebody they live with says, why, what did you get? We got it, made some STI testing. Why do you need that? Right, just to avoid that. Yeah, any fixed address uh, where you can pick up can be used. Great, so when the test results come in, are they connected to other systems such as Connecting Ontario? Yes, everything that we go through uh, the private lab system and PHOL. So anything that's available uh, in Connecting Ontario, this would be uh, there. Are, most of the time people are using their health cards as well. Uh, so you, you, all of it is visible through Connecting Ontario. In terms of opting in and out of uh, a test, if someone opts out of a test, is there any counseling that's provided on why they should receive that test? It's just the blurb that pops up that says, um, I am. I acknowledge that I am opting out of testing that's clinically indicated for me, uh, which could leave me at risk for delayed diagnosis and associated sequelae. It doesn't use that word, but that's effectively the message. For the follow-up reminders that people receive by email, can those be opted out of as well? Uh, they only get them once. So no, you, once you order, you get one retest reminder once thereafter, and you, nothing occurs after that. An individual who doesn't reorder, that is the opt-out. Okay, well, maybe we can get into some of the stats of the program. Do you have, um, you showed us the dashboard that you're able to view. Do you have any information, um, such as the number of requests that are coming in by public health unit? I do have that. I don't have it available, like just off the top of my head. Um, we had for the self tests for 2023, which I do know off the top of my head, we have had approximately 5,000 orders across Ontario. Um, from that, it's everywhere. There is not a single part of Ontario where people aren't accessing uh, testing and services uh, and coming already. Once we activate the STI, right, if a local health unit saying, yes, we do want to do this, uh, when people come back, um, they don't even need to know the STI part has been turned on, right? They're just suddenly offered. You're also indicated for testing. To date, we have been telling you, here's your self-test. Go and find all of this other STI testing somewhere close to you. We just make it available. But there's not, there's, it, it's everywhere. It's not just Ottawa and Eastern Ontario. Like the self-tests are going out everywhere. 5,000 across the province last year. Are you able to tell um, how many uh, orders don't get completed by the client? Mm -hmm. So for the self-test, the self -test, it's a bit trickier. It's the number that are reported, and our reporting rate sits around 60-ish percent. Uh, for the um, STI testing, it's, it's around 60% as well of people who go, uh, and so around 40% of the requisitions we cancel. So of all the individuals who go in, so the 543, it would be about 60% who actually uh, made it to the lab. So the positivity rates actually that I showed would be close to double that uh, if you were to restrict down to the number who actually did the testing. Okay, so maybe some questions on expansion of the program. So I'll theme them a little bit. There's um, clinicians on the call who might be in a public health unit that is not currently offering um, this testing uh, program. Is this something that they'd be able to volunteer for? Uh, yes, yeah, people can send me an email. Uh, we can sit down and talk and we can go through a lot more of the actual sort of minute details of right, putting a name on the requisition, the 
sharing all the privacy impact assessments, the cybersecurity reviews, the annual vulnerability and penetration testing for the website, all of that can be shared, um, taken back the data sharing agreements to say, we're offering the service, you're gonna be able to log in to see results. We both have to do things to make sure right confidentiality is maintained. So we can set up a meeting to really go through those minute details and anyone can email me and we can uh, set that up. Have you done any partnering with organizations that um, cater to clients without a fixed address, thinking of the shelter population, for example? We haven't for this, um, and th th there's two parts to this. One is STI testing can't be done anonymously. That's just not allowed in Ontario. HIV testing and the self-tests, sure. Uh, we do a lot for people with, uh, right, who are in shelters, who are, have no fixed address, but the STI testing really is restricted because um, it, it needs to be nominal according to regulations in Ontario. Second thing though is this system's not perfect for everyone. Um, the, people will come back appropriately and say, well, if you have language issues, if you have an intellectual disability, if you're blind, this isn't gonna work, correct. Like uh, I'm fully aware of that and will be the first to admit this. But there are hundreds of thousands of people who can use the system who do need screening. What I would love to see and what we are starting to see is that they can use the online system so that when I, and I will be this afternoon, right, in the bricks and mortar STI clinic seeing patients, I would like them to be the individuals who I need to see in person, right? And so your well, 40-year-old, affluent, very well-connected individual could go online and use this. Right? instead of taking one of the appointment spots or the drop-in spots in the STI clinic, so that when I'm in the clinic, I can see those who need injectable treatments, who need the vaccines, who need uh, assessment of symptoms, who can't follow the website, won't follow the website. It frees up my appointments because who's most likely to use the website? Right, That individual I was just talking about. But it's the same person who is most likely to be able to get access into the bricks and mortar centers. So it's just saying, if we can divert some people to this system, which hopefully works better for them. When I'm in person, hopefully I can also see the people who need to be there, who need to actually be seeing nurses and physicians. For clients that have a primary care provider, do those results get automatically sent? Are they able to list them on the requisition? They aren't. Um, and this is this is something that uh, perhaps actually you and Austin and I could talk about after. So the way the RECs work is the ordering provider, whoever it is in your region, right, is listed as the ordering provider. If you look at the MOH and the PHLL requisitions, there's only one copy two option on the physical requisitions right now. That copy two is dedicated so that people can see their results. Um, I have toyed around for the last like couple months with, oh, I should say like a question that says, do you have a primary care provider? Would you like them to know? We know that a bunch of people aren't, they're gonna say no, but an individual who does, could I put it on there? But you can't double copy on the current requisitions. so. That's the rate limiting step here. For the requisitions that get generated, is it all automatic or is there someone behind the scenes that is reviewing them for accuracy before they get sent to the client? 100% are reviewed clinically. The same way when I went in and showed you, I went through everything to make sure that the risk assessment right, was working perfectly. Computers are wonderful. Um, the HIV self-assessment is exceptionally accurate now that we run 10,000 people through it. Uh, the STI one, it, it's actually working flawlessly, but we still, at some point, someone's going to generate a combination of answers that we hadn't thought of. We're going to get an unusual outcome. A clinician reviews all of them, uh, then hits generate. Uh, then it goes to logistics for actually mail out. So it's not a, I want it, therefore I automatically get it. It's, I want it, this is what's recommended to you. What are you opting into? Clinical review, right, mail out through logistics. For users that might take a little bit of time to get their test completed, uh, if it goes past, I think it was a two week deadline, was it to? Um, uh, two months. Two month, de two month deadline. Um, will they have to go through the whole process again to get a new requisition or are they able to go in and just reprint their old one? Uh, no, they would need to go in and do the risk assessment. And the reason for this is two months later, their risk practices may have changed, right? They may have indications for more testing. So we don't want to say two months ago, this is what we told you you need. Uh, now, today, we'd like to tell you what you need again. So we have people go back through the risk assessment. There's a question on when the results come in. So does the ordering provider first 
view them to see what the result is before it's released to the client, or does it get released to the client and the ordering provider at the same time? At uh, the same time, for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, uh, we haven't had serology positive. It's just been the self test to date. Uh, HIV, we would uh, ensure that, that the ordering provider reaches out before it's released, but gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis uh, is immediately available. Um, this, I mean, most people are already going to have direct access to it if they have an account through Dynacare or they have an account through their local lab. They can go on and see these labs before ordering providers uh, right away for much more serious things than chlamydia. Uh, so it, it's uh, immediate for those results. And to view those results as the ordering physician, let's say it's an MOH, do they get an email notification that a result is ready or would they log into the get a kit system to see the results for all the tests that have been ordered? Yeah, no, it'll be sent to their system. So like PHOL or the private lab will generate the two recs. They'll make three if it's positive, but they'll make two if it's negative, one to get a kit, one to the ordering provider. Uh, this would go into your electronic medical record or into the paper file system and effectively what most people do is you you file the negatives, uh, right? And then anyone who has a positive result, you create a patient record at that point, extracting the data from um, get a kit. They reach out, contact the person and make sure they're treated. And then if it's positive, there's a third, which is the right one that goes to the MOH who has already gotten it through the clinical part. So they get a, another uh, reminder of a positive result. Yeah, there's a question on some of the other um, non-STBBI resources available on the get a kit website so there was reference to covid self-testing is that something that is still available online? no um, we did that actually this was back in 2021 we had i think it was 7,000 lucera rapid lamps um this was before everyone was doing self-tests all the time and we worked with the ministry to say like could we do an alternate risk algorithm and send these out uh, and it did work um yeah, there's, it basically shows the platform can do absolutely anything and add any tests that we were to need to uh, based on public need, uh, right? It can be adapted. Okay, well, I see we're almost at time. Uh, so we'll wrap it up here, Patrick, and want to thank you for presenting today. Uh, for those still on the call, you'd expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHR round survey for today's session. Please try to complete this to help us improve our programming. A reminder to everyone that topic, which is the Ontario Public Health uh, Convention, will be held in person on March 26th and virtually on April 3rd. You can check out topic.ca for details, and that's T-O-P-H-C.ca. Lastly, to access past PHO presentations and to view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to Education and Events, and click on Presentations. I want to thank you once again, Patrick, and wishing everyone on the call a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Have a good day.